I think God is drawing us together in His body closer and closer. We are being called to really come out of Babylon, come out of the world systems, and come into God's kingdom ways in all areas. Hey, this is the Unrefined Podcast. I am Brandon Spain, your host, with co-host Lindsay Waters. Welcome to another episode. Hey, everybody out there. We have a special show today. We have a, a really awesome guest that is very near and dear to Lindsay and I both, and so want to give a shout out to Lindsay. Hey. Hey. I'm here. He's here. And but the the guest we have today is is a a woman that has been a mentor in a lot of ways in my life and has just influenced me and and brought different things into my life that I needed to have at the right time at the right moment cuz she hears the Lord so well in my opinion. And I would just like to introduce uh, Liz Alita. And what we're going to kind of shoot for today is is sort of a a primer on spiritual mapping with spiritual warfare, you know, what it is and and, and that kind of stuff, and its implications to be practical in our lives, some practical ways we can implement it, both individually and communally, and the impact that it'll have as we do as we do the mission that God has put all of us on, we're all on mission. So welcome, Liz, to our show. Thanks. It's good to be with you. Yeah. Hey, Liz. Hi, Liz. Thank you. Would you start out, Liz, just by, uh, there's so much that, that you've been involved in. I just, uh, I, I want you just to start out, just introduce yourself a little bit and some of your journey and and what led you to getting into what we're going to talk about today. Well, it's kind of interesting, Brandon, because I will be celebrating 40 years in missions this year. My husband and I got married in 1979, and the Lord kind of had us on a fast-track discipleship. Um, we had done uh, ministry in our local church and got involved in crisis pregnancy ministry and in the political arena related to the pro-life areas. And we just began uh, also at the same time getting involved in short-term missions trips. And we began to see more and more that, well, first of all, we were learning that all of life was meant to be under the Lordship of Jesus. And as we saw that, we realized, you know, the issues are heart issues, spiritual issues, um, that it wasn't, uh, in terms of pro-life, it wasn't about, we often felt like it seemed like they were casting it as the problem was this baby. But to us, the problem wasn't the baby, unwanted or unplanned pregnancy, but it was a broken or a lack of a relationship with Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. And so it sent us on a journey wanting to share G- Jesus, who Jesus is and how to walk with him. So that kind of began it. So we've been now 40 years involved in ministry overseas, around the world. Um, my husband passed away two years ago now, a little over two years ago. Uh, and I'm still involved in now with my youngest daughter and her husband, who are full-time also with me now. So it's uh, the journey took us to um, the Himalayan area for a while. And in the 90s, we were... Uh, discovering along with a lot of other people, Luke 10, and began to see some small movements start um, where disciples were making disciples and fellowships were multiplying fellowships. And I suppose that's where we began to explore the idea of spiritual mapping and understanding why darkness lingers where it does, as George Otis Jr. says. And um, so we've been involved in um, partnership facilitation, uh, especially focused on unreached people groups around the world, and in uh, prayer training and mobilization, and also training and coaching church planters, focusing on igniting movements to Christ. 
So that's kind of a quick overview. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> that's an overwhelming overview. You've been, you've had your hands in so many <laughs> yeah. different things, which is, is awesome. I mean, I, I think it's incredible how the Lord has used Tom and you and now you. Um, I miss Tom. I think about him pretty often, honestly, when I get to going on my Bigfoot tirades. So he's my, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I just knew him that one weekend and I, he, uh, he impacted me as well. I enjoyed being around him. You know, one of the, uh, I've been part of a women's Bible study recently. We've been doing Philippians and the verse that talks about he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. And they were talking in the study that, you know, even after your death, God continues bringing forth fruit from what he's sown into the kingdom through you. And I'm seeing that in Tom's life. So many people I run into tell me about how um, what what God did through Tom is still impacting them. So I, I, I'm grateful for that. And it's encouraging to me as I'm getting older to say, I'm so glad, Lord, when you feel like so much is still to be done, that you keep it going. You keep watering those seeds and they keep bearing fruit uh, for your glory. So that's awesome. Yeah, it is. Well, let me let me ask you a one of the first questions I want to on, on the agenda here is, um, all right, it's kind of two part. It, it, you know, could you give us a brief synopsis of spiritual mapping, like you know what it is, et cetera, stuff like that, and then also to piggyback on that, if you were going to write a book, because there's so many books out there on spiritual mapping, and I think there is a bibliography on your website, which we're going to post your website in our show notes. But also, we're gonna. I'll let you give it at the end. But there's so many books out there on spiritual mapping. If you were gonna write your own book, Liz, practically with what you've learned, what would you include and disclude? What have you learned and unlearned? Maybe that's two questions. Let's just split it up. So just go ahead and and give us a a, a brief synopsis of spiritual mapping and and how uh, you learned about it and what you've learned and just the general details, if you can. Well, to, to just understand what it is, um, the term you're using, spirit, or the terms you're using, spiritual mapping, it was first coined by George Otis Jr. in 1990, and he defined it as superimposing our understanding of forces and events in the spiritual domain onto places and circumstances in the material world. That's pretty complicated. I'll go back back up a little bit and talk about how I began to explore this area of how the supernatural and the natural overlap. And I would say it certainly goes back to a prayer journey that we took in 1993 with George Otis Jr. It was part of the first sets of prayer journeys that were taken into the 1040 window in 1993. Um, now, what is what is the 1040 window? Yeah, in the 1990s, Louise Bush had uh, was calling the church to recognize that there was an area of the world that seems to have a very high percentage of uh, people that are uh, like poverty, people from the major non-Christian world religions. Um, just an area of the world that seems like the gospel has not yet penetrated really well. And so it ran from 10 degrees north to 40 degrees north and uh, from the west coast of Africa across to the east coast of Asia. So it's just kind of a rectangular box, and they coined the the term 1040 window uh, to just indicate it was something like 80% or 90% of the world's least reached people groups live in that area. So there was a real call to focus on ethnic or people groups uh, to bring the gospel there. Um, In countries, um, Albania is a good example, where the gospel penetrated, but it was mainly in one particular group of people or ethnic group. Mm -hmm. And many of the other groups living in Albania were fairly untouched by the gospel. And so there were voices in the missions community pointing out that we needed to have a people group focus, an ethnic group focus, to see the gospel really penetrate uh, and get to every person. Uh, There's a different strategy needed when you think about 
uh, the people's culture, their, how their society works, um, you know, who they interface with, who they intermarry with, and so on. They're bridges that have to be crossed to, for the gospel to be successfully shared and to see it grow up. So uh, that period of the 90s, the AD 2000 and beyond movement, uh, really was at the forefront of calling the body of Christ to recognize these gaps and to focus there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that definition. So just to, to keep going. So we were part of that early wave in 1993, did a prayer journey to North India, Nepal, Bhutan, and Tibet, uh, as I said, with George Otis Jr., it was very eye-opening to me. He was doing a lot of interviews that ended up in his book called The Twilight Labyrinth. Excellent book, and I, I recommend it highly. But he was trying to understand why darkness lingers where it does. And um, he was looking and doing interviews uh, with people that had experienced supernatural. Uh, they'd uh, been raised from the dead. We saw him interview one man that had had been uh, beaten and thrown in a river and uh, was on the funeral pyre about to be burned. And a woman prayed and God raised him up, raised him up from the dead. And now he was an evangelist wow. uh, in Nepal. Incredible to meet him and hear his story. And others like that, that had experienced tremendous um, moves, movements of God on their behalf. Another fellow that eventually um, came to be on our board for a time was a Tibetan pastor. He had been a Tibetan monk, Tibetan Buddhist monk, mm -hmm. had come to faith in Christ and was telling us he lived in a little community in Northwest India. He had seen a commotion in the village when he and his wife went down to see what was going on. And there was a monk inside a home levitating about six feet off the ground, cross-legged, and he was licking a live coal. And the two of them looked in and they were, you know, kind of astonished or, you know, they were trying to comprehend what was happening. And um, he fell to the ground and looked at them and said, you do not belong here. They, they left, you know, <laughs> but it was a uh, a power encounter, you know, that just the presence of Christ that they carried with them uh, shifted the atmosphere. And so other kinds of stories like that. But we began trying to understand, OK. God had laid on our heart uh, the country called Bhutan and the Tibetan Buddhist world in particular uh, as a starting point. And so trying to understand how would God break through into a place that was so walled off from the gospel. Um, that was officially a Tibetan Buddhist kingdom and uh, restricted access because of various reasons, uh, very difficult to get a visa to go in. And so praying and asking the Lord, so how do we, how do we approach this? You're calling us here, but it, it seems to us like Jericho, that was a city walled up tight with no one going out or coming in. And so in trying to answer that question, God took us on this journey to understand how to look at not just what we see in the natural realm, but how God sees things and the the spiritual history, the spiritual dynamics that are going on there. So we understand how we war, how we um, see those strongholds taken down and the gospel light begin to penetrate into that darkness. Yeah, that, that's, that's interesting because that's basically the, the purpose of our podcast is to introduce people to the supernatural and miraculous and that, that the world is is very thin, that there are thin spaces that, that, that where the kingdom of God is at hand, so to speak, as Jesus yeah. would say. And, you know, I think we compartmentalize, we Western Christians compartmentalize, whereas other Christians in the world don't. And we need to learn from them, like what you're saying, that that land is an inherently spiritual as well as physical, that objects, that people, that, you know, everything is inherently spiritual as well as physical and has a, you know, a, an, an impact in the world. And I, in my, in my opinion, I think the spiritual and all, oftentimes is more real than the physical world is. 
Well, I think the Bible kind of hints at that anyway when it says um, uh, don't focus on the things that are seen, which are temporary, but on the things which are unseen, which are eternal. So I think uh, there's a lot in Scripture that that demonstrates to us and that says to us, you know, that there's more more than meets the eye in a sense that uh, the verse that talks about for we war not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of this darkness of this present age and so on. So continuing on in your story, you began to equip yourself with these keys of spiritual mapping. And then where did that lead you? Well, we, we, um, the prayer journey itself, I think, was uh, an interesting experience because I had not ever um, honestly done prayer walking like I experienced it with that group. There was a group of between 10 and 20 of us that went together. And so we began the days, you know, praying together and worshiping and just orienting with the Lord, focused on the Lord, and then trying to discern, you know, what were his instructions for the day. And the group would go out uh, according to where we felt like the Lord directing us and would walk and with our eyes open looking, you know, Jesus in, um, in John 4, 34 and 35, he said uh, the disciples, he and the disciples were in Samaria. And uh, you may remember the story. The disciples were hungry, so they were focused on finding food. But Jesus rebuked them and he told them, my food, um, Jesus said, is to do the will of him who sent me and finish his work. Do you not say four months more and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They're ripe for harvest. Um, some versions say lift up your eyes and it made me realize you know when I walk a lot of times my eyes are focused on the sidewalk or the land right ahead of where my feet are going and I'm not paying any attention to what's around me you know the very things that are there I'm oblivious everybody may not be that way but that's definitely me and that lift your eyes in this prayer walk I was learning to really look and ask God to help me see with his eyes And it's amazing what you begin to hear from the Lord as you're looking and asking him to let you see with his eyes a lot of insights in how to pray into the spiritual conditions of the place and so on. So that kind of began a journey trying to understand, okay, Lord, show us what we need to see and then teach us how do we deal with what we're seeing. So, Liz, what would you say, uh, this is kind of a mathy question <laughs> a little bit, uh, let's just say, if you, you percentages-wise, how much of it would you say is more prayer, leading of the spirit oriented versus um, the more practical research and engagement-oriented part? Well, that's a good question, Lindsay. I think it's both. Uh, we were told to love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. So to me, that's every part of us with our mind and also with our soul, our spirit. And so in loving him and loving others, we're using all of who we are and all of who Jesus is in us to uh, connect with God uh, through intimacy with him, through Prayer, we call it prayer communing and tuning our ear to hear him. I think a lot of times when we say the word prayer, people think about talking to God, but they don't think about mm. listening yeah, to God. Yeah, very true. It's yeah. kind of an unfortunate thing <laughs> because I think it's meant to be a conversational relationship with God where we speak to him, but we also listen to him. And so it's a combination. I think he teaches us and shows us. And when we I used to think you have to teach people to hear God, and I've decided that's not right. People hear, they just don't pay any attention, Mm. or they don't recognize that it's God's voice. Mm. I think that's true, Mm. yeah. To be honest, you know, just learning more about the the research, the more practical aspect of it. When I first heard about spiritual mapping years ago, I I mostly just heard about the, the more... Honestly, it just sounded like people 
you know, looking for signs, and I was probably getting a very one-sided view of it, but, you know, just, to me, it just all sounded like very sort of mystical and looking for signs and, and omens, and, and I kind of didn't know about all the more practical, just research part of it that was involved. Yeah. So, yeah, that was a, kind of a misconception I had about it, that it was it was all spiritual and, and nothing practical. You know, if you take, you're asking about kind of the research and the practical side of it. Uh, when we were teaching church planters, we would talk about using a map. You know, even if it's a hand-drawn map, um, we would have them ask the Lord, where is their vineyard? Where is the assignment, the field? You know, what area are they to focus on? And then we would have them uh, break it down. You know, where is the Lord telling you to begin? And then in a bite-sized portion, you know, okay, make a map or get a map of it. And then walk and pray and look and write on the map. What is God showing you? What is there? Are there churches? Are there temples? Are there idols? Are there occult centers or uh, drug or alcohol centers or places of crime or immorality and so on? And just looking, when you put it, record what you're finding on a map a story begins to come, you'll find that darkness seems to cluster together. It's very interesting. Um, you can do this even, you know, in your own, wherever you are, your own little hometown, just start putting on a map and identifying places of light, places of darkness. You know, from a biblical standpoint, that's not too difficult to discern. Yeah. And then begin to ask the Lord, okay, Lord, what am I seeing here? And you'll begin to the Holy Spirit will begin to show you uh, what you're seeing is beyond the physical reality. You'll begin to see into the spiritual reality of what's happening there. Yeah, that's fascinating. You can also, you know, when we talk about the practical, I'll go on and mention you can use a calendar because uh, we're not only uh, geographically oriented, there's time, mm. right? So yeah. if you think about um, calendars, Certain festivals or rituals or pilgrimages and so on. There are certain times of the year when uh, things happen, marking that on the calendar and pay attention. You know, what's going on now? What are you sensing in the spiritual realm during that season of the year? There are certain times that darkness seems to be more prevalent. And you can do that with a calendar as well as with a map. Another thing you can do is use a timeline, which is a different type of way of a marking time. But looking back into the history of the area, what what community woundings have happened or offenses, what uh, battles have happened or disasters, and those can often mark times when the enemy has uh, kind of put down or erected those strongholds against the knowledge of God as a result of different things that have happened on the land. You know, the Bible talks about the land being defiled. Mm -hmm. And that begins to open up another dimension of what's been happening in the spiritual realm and that has attached itself to certain areas. So different it's like different lenses that you can look through to perceive beyond what you're just seeing in the physical. Yeah, I find that interesting. You're talking about the time aspect. Lindsay and I both have been kind of doing a deep dive into the, I don't know if you're familiar with this uh, old true crime case but it's the west memphis three it was these three little boys that were murdered by these three teenage boys who were accused of being satanic involvement occult involvement and stuff and one of the interesting things is they were let out because hollywood did a big move to to basically thwart justice and get these murderers put out of jail that's my opinion uh, i'm just saying that and but one of the things they had an occult specialist come in and one of the things that he brought out about the murders of the three little boys is they occurred at a time that was highly occultic. It was a full moon and a certain, I can't remember what demonic holiday or something like that, that it seemed to end, or something like that. Yeah. That, that, that's, yeah. that certainly indicated that. And so I, you're right. It's like certain times can be defiled as well. Times during the year that need to be cleansed. Uh, Halloween, the, the different, you know, solstices, the high, high satanic days. Even 
I've heard what the witching hours, what three to three to five in the morning, you know, that, that yeah. there's certain times of the day that are even defiled. So I, I find that fascinating mm-hmm. with, and, and this is all encompassed in this whole spiritual mapping thing you're talking about with the different lenses. Yeah, I think, I think you're yeah. right. Yeah. So what are some key, say I'm a skeptic. Okay. This is just kind of a devil's advocate question. I'm a skeptic and I say, okay, so Liz, where's this in the Bible? What are some, what do you think are some key scriptures that you could give to somebody that would show them that, that this is, you know, we're going along the, at least maybe not the necessarily always the letter, but we are going with the spirit of the new Testament. Yeah, well, I would, um, there's a couple of keys. I, I'll point to the website where we've, uh, it's called um, prayerstrategist.net, plural, on the strategists with an S, dot net, under prayer research. There's the first scripture. We, we've set them up as what's called Discovery Bible Study Story Sets. Yes to help kind of explore the topic. So the the ones that I'll point out, we begin actually that lift up your eyes from John 4, um, 31 to and on. Um, but we also talk about in the Old Testament uh, when Moses sent out the spies to explore the promised land. If you remember in Numbers 13, 1 through 13. Yeah. And looking at, you know, why did he do that? And and um, if for those that don't know what a discovery Bible study is, you basically read the scripture and you let the scripture and the Holy Spirit teach you. And you just ask, you know, what am I learning about God? What am I learning about people? Um, what's God telling me to do about this? You know, and, you know, how do I obey it? What Who do I share it with? It's pretty simple. But uh, in looking at those scriptures, um, you can see that there was a reason God had them go look. He wanted them to look at the land and to to understand. Another one is Paul in Athens in the New Testament, Acts 17 in verses 16 to 34. Um, Paul, apparently, when he came to Athens, it says that he walked about the city. And then he begins that discourse um, presenting the gospel using the idea of the unknown God, the God that they were worshiping, but was unknown to them. Mm -hmm. And so it's another aspect of the idea of praying and walking. God can give you strategies to present the gospel through bridges to the gospel that are already there. You know, the Bible says he set eternity in our hearts. And I believe that in every people, there are keys that are there that he's put there that are sort of the door openers to the heart for those people. So by praying and walking, God can show you those keys that then make it very easy to present the gospel to someone. Yeah. Well, and I also think about too, and you know, our, our mutual friend Neil talks on, and, and I, I've been trying to talk him into doing a, a YouTube video on this. So maybe I can get him to do it on praying for uh what is it uh, binding the strong man in an area when you go in and mm-hmm. prayer walking and and uh i think he has a book on it on kindle i'm not sure but i've been trying to to get him to do a, a youtube video on it so what do you think about that whole that teaching uh as it relates to spiritual mapping binding the strong man in an area well again yeah neil neil talks about that very often when you begin to walk and pray in an area uh, God will bring you up in in an encounter with the the strong man, you know, which often uh, the enemy uses a person to wield his power. He can't. The spiritual realm has to operate through the humans. Mm. So um, someone or some group of people are being used to exert authority over the area on behalf of the enemy. So. Often, um, like you could think about in Acts 16, when the woman uh, with the spirit of divination, some of the versions say spirit of Python or Pythonus, was uh, harassing Paul, and uh, he eventually casts the spirit out. Mm-hmm. Um, it, I think that's an example. Um, 
uh, it ended up landing um, Paul and Silas in jail. But then on account of that, they led the Philippian jailer and his household to the Lord. So God used that, even that situation where uh, he delivered the girl, but then it landed him in problems. But even that problem produced more fruit for the kingdom. So I think that um, principle is a, is a powerful one. And, and again, like I say, prayer walking, um, when you think about it in terms of praying and walking and not, not praying in the sense of talk, 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 but listening mm-hmm. and looking and letting God tell you what are you seeing, what's the realities there, how should you be praying into it, how should you be addressing it, what strategies are there. To me, that's the real value. And then, of course, often meeting the person of peace. Um, strongman is one side of it, kind of the negative side of it, the, the barrier or those that are standing against the gospel. But there's also those whose hearts are prepared for the gospel that are waiting for the person of peace, for, for the person, the messenger to come to present the gospel. So both sides uh, can come from putting yourself out there, being on the streets and among the people. Um, to be able to see the gospel breakthrough in that area. Mm. Yeah. So Liz, I kind of told you about one of my misconceptions, um, just that it was all spiritual and not very practical. Can you think of any other kind of misconceptions you've encountered when you just talk to people about spiritual mappings? Like what, what, how do people think- react when you, when you first even mention the term to them? That's kind of why we changed the term to prayer research because yeah. spiritual mapping sounds creepy or <laughs> ethereal or otherworldly or whatever. Um, but it's very clearly in the Bible. You know, you just have to have eyes to look at it, really look and see what you're reading. And I think that's one of the advantages of, of studying the Bible with others in a group setting where you're sharing, what are you seeing? You know, what are we really seeing here? What's going on? And actually, uh, actually but, getting their input, actually yeah. getting their input, you know, yeah. instead of just a talking head telling you, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think then the practice of doing it, you know, you obey and then you see, um, when you do what God's asking you to do, he's not going to explain it to you ahead of time. But when you obey, often the understanding comes after the understanding follows the obedience. So prayer walking, I think, is putting feet to your to your prayers and being out there and being available, um, being in the place where he's calling you to be. When we tr- have trained church planters, um, we generally would make a practice of having them, you know, it said in Luke 10, which is the section of scripture that God really took a number of different people in the 90s to Luke 10 and ended up catalyzing some of the early movements to Christ through them as they began to try to unpack Luke 10 and understand it. So Jesus is sending them out, the 72 or the 70 some versions say two by two, everywhere he was about to come. So how did they know where he was about to come? Well, they had to start in his presence, Mm. right? So for us, that means we want to start at his feet, listening to him and saying, okay, where are you sending me to? Where are you about to come? And then going out with a partner is always a good idea because one person might notice one thing. The other person knows something else. But then if you remember the old monaural sound and then the difference when you get stereo, it's like, wow, this is like a lot more clear, a lot more brilliant. The same with the spiritual revelation, I think, is that you get two people, you get the confirmation of witness, And we would find that uh, as they would pray together about where was God sending them, sometimes one would have a picture of a place. The other one would have a picture of a person. Mm. And sure enough, they would go to the place and they would find the person. And so the two pieces fit like uh, two pieces of a jigsaw puzzle together and uh, gave them the full directions and the full instructions. So, Can you think of any other kind of pitfalls or... Or cautions uh, when people are engaged in spiritual mapping. Yeah, I have a friend who says uh, 
you never go into Dodge with your guns blazing. <laughs> <laughs> if you used to watch any of the old Westerns, um, sometimes the cowboys would, you know, ride into town with their guns just firing up in the air. Um, there's there's a, a real wisdom. Um, a fellow named John Paul Jackson wrote a book called Needless Casualties of War. Um, the powers that are where they are are there because they have been given permission to be there. And we need to move under the authority of our commander in chief and understand what is our assignment. Just like in any battle in a military, uh, the individual soldiers are not left to their own devices to, to do whatever they want. There's a strategy that's given down from the commander in chief. And that's the same with us. We're uh, called as soldiers of the cross. You know, we're called to be part of his uh, army to love and bring love to the earth. But we want to work within the framework of the assignment he's giving us, and we want to work under his authority. And so we want to be sure that what we're doing is within the the assignment of the time and the uh, the place and what he's giving us to do. So um, I think that's one thing is to really um, to just recognize the authority that we have and to be obedient. Um, I think for me, the time is always a weak thing. I may feel like I've heard from the Lord about what something, what he's saying, but then I often run off without getting the how and the when. Mm. And uh, <laughs> we need to be sure we get the full instructions. <laughs> yeah, I'm guilty as charged. I do the same thing. Yeah, just kind of saying as I'm like a bull in a china shop when I, when I do that. So, well, I'm kind of the other way around. I, I got to wait for the perfect moment all the time <laughs> and then yep. don't do anything. I feel like God's, you know, when you train dogs, one of the last or one of the hardest things to train them is the command to heal, H-E-E-L, where they walk without the leash right beside you. They don't go ahead or behind. If you stop, they stop. If you start walking, they walk with you. I feel like God's had me in that training for some time that I don't either lag behind or I don't run ahead, but I stay right with him. That's, that's a hard one for me to learn. I agree. Very hard, particularly when you're more type A driven type person, which I know you are. And I, I am too. You, you, you want to go conquer the world yesterday and you want everybody, or everybody <laughs> around you should get on board and let's go do it, you know? And, and it's, it's difficult. Uh, I have a, so oh, go ahead. Let me let me throw in yeah. real quick before you move on. You gave me the perfect segue. There's an old book by Andrew Murray called Waiting on God. <clears throat> it's I highly recommend it, but there's a new version that a friend of mine has updated, um, Colin Millar, and um, it's available on Amazon. Uh, it's a 31-day adventure into the heart of God, but it's just focused on waiting on God, and it is an excellent um, tool um, to use to really stop. And it doesn't have to be long, but just to pause and really focus on, okay, Lord, I, I belong to you. Everything is yours. This is your kingdom that we're building. You've invited me to join you. You're the, you're the creator. You are the provider. I can't do anything apart from you. And just waiting and waiting on God and listening and quieting yourself. So I highly recommend that um, Waiting on God. It's listed by Andrew Murray, but Colin Millard did the recent edit in modern language. It's an excellent book. Yeah, I'm going to check that out. A book, definitely. I'm going to check that out. <laughs> We'd love for you to consider joining our exclusive membership, which includes episodes for members only and a private group where we discuss in greater depth those hot topics that matter to you, our audience. You can find the details on our website, unrefinedpodcast.com. Lindsay, uh, do you have anything right this second? Or I, I kind of have something if you don't have anything mm -hmm. right. Shoot. I'd like to it's it's kind of a dual question again and, and, and it fits together is why i want to ask it is i just wanted you to speak to the importance which you kind of have about the two by two but speak to the importance of teams when it comes to the 
prayer research or spiritual mapping, I'm going to start using prayer research too. Uh, yeah, that's a great term yeah, for it. And uh, it's maybe a less, less the red flag raising term, well, maybe. <laughs> maybe perfect for our podcast, though. Yeah. <laughs> We're kind of weird. Sandy and I do inner healing, and we've pretty much bopped that word out of that because so much baggage, you know. So we just call it prayer, prayer, either healing prayer or prayer counseling, you know. But yeah. uh, so we understand yeah. the terminology gets bad juju attached to it, so to speak. Uh, but the other one is like speak to the importance of teams when it comes to spiritual researching. But then I want to give you a hypothetical that you can kind of this is kind of difficult, but not that not that bad. Like if a group goes into an area to start a movement, what's what are the what are some of the first steps that you would tell them to prepare the ground for ministry? Well, I'll back up way back in the 80s, 1980s. Um, there was a group that began teaching about a role called a strategy coordinator, or they also called it non-residential missionary. It was developed because they were realizing more and more of the world were restricted access, where for someone wanting to go in to bring the gospel, it was not possible. Uh, you, you know, some places you can still go on a missionary visa, but many parts of the world now, more so now than even back in the 80s, you cannot. And it has to be uh, brought in other ways, creative ways. So there was a training that uh, my husband and I had gone through, and it talks about the four pillars that the gospel comes. And I think that's still true today, that it comes through prayer. It comes through scripture and literature, media. Uh, it comes through, um, I will say media is another one, which would include all of the new tools, all of the tech type varieties now with uh, uh, chips for your phone, all kinds of other things like that. And then interpersonal witness. Um, but we would begin researching um to better understand, you know, if God is calling us to, say, the the Bamar uh, Buddhists of Myanmar, uh, we would want to know as much as we could find out. Um, if God's sending us there, you know, who are they? What's their history? And so on, before we ever get there. But once you get there and you're on the ground, of course, a lot of times you're trying to learn language, you're trying to get uh, integrated you know, into whatever place you're going to hold in that community. Um, but having a team, uh, I mentioned earlier about the two by two, how you can go from just one person, kind of like that manorial sound to like stereo. Well, if you have a team, take it up even a higher notch to like the uh, Dolby sound or the surround sound, you know, that's even bigger. I think listening together and working on something together with a team so that all of the fivefold gifting can be part of it, um, all the different perspectives, each of us bring a different perspective that can really enrich your understanding. Plus, you think about the scriptures in Ecclesiastes, for example, that talks about a threefold cord is not easily broken um, and the power of agreement. Um, Jesus said, if two or three of you agree is touching anything, then you have it. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot of aspects to community. God called us into community. Um, he calls us into a family. And so he's um, pleased to invite us in to work with him. And I think that's part of the ethos of kingdom is that we work together mm -hmm. as part of community. We complete one another. So there's a lot of strength. Um, working together as a team and each one can bring their unique giftings and skills and abilities and perspectives. And it just, uh, many hands make light work mm -hmm. and that's true spiritually too. Well, when you talked about kind of strategy coordinators versus, you know, kind of people who are there boots on the ground type people, if that works, it, it just made me think about just kind of this, this truth that, you know, you need some people who are farther away from it, who can look at it a little bit more objectively than the people who are kind of in the trenches and the, a little bit more emotional about it. Would you say that that's kind of important for teams as well? 
that's a great segue for me, Lindsay, to mention the role of prayer strategists. Um, we, our website, our group is called Fellowship of Prayer Strategists, and that came up from the idea of, if you remember the old sailing ships, the ships with sails and masts, and there would be a fellow that would go up in the crow's nest, you know, up high on the mm. mast to look ahead and watch out for rocks or whatever. And then there would be the captain at the helm of the ship steering. Uh, but the perspective was needed, you know, but he couldn't steer from up there. Mm -hmm. It required the cooperation of both of mm -hmm. them. So that's the idea of a prayer strategist is there is in a team, if you have one person or a couple of people, several people that focus on uh, being in the crow's nest, so to speak, listening to God, uh, paying attention from the spiritual perspective. Um, we've always contended that um, in any kind of a gospel endeavor, it's great if you have somebody that's assigned to be the lookout in a sense that, that is keeping their ear to, to heaven, listening to the Holy Spirit, and just keeping that perspective. And then whoever is, uh, even in, let's say, crisis response, you know, if you're part of a team that's responding to an earthquake or a tsunami or uh, flooding or whatever, if you have somebody that's responsible to pay attention to the spiritual dynamics and then others that are focused on the physical things that are going on or the security issues or whatever, different people can take different roles. And that role of a prayer strategist can be really powerful because then they can address and call attention. Hey, wait a minute. We, I sense this going on. Let's stop a minute. Let's address this with the Lord. Mm -hmm. And it can really cut through a lot of the opposition spiritually and help accelerate the process um, that God's taking us through. So same for church planning movement or disciple banking movement teams. If they have those that function in that role, they just are taking that assignment to really pay attention to what's happening in the spiritual realm. What are the spiritual dynamics in mobilizing, coordinating communication for prayer and prayer support? And so the whole website, prayerstrategist.net, is geared to serving those people that would like to be in that kind of a role and would like to learn more about what that might look like. And so, um, again, that prayerstrategist.net uh, would be where they can go and check that out. Well, let me ask you this. On the uh, website, there's also something that's there called prayer coaching. Now, what what is that? I, it, that sounds like something like, like, honestly, we're trying to promote extraordinary prayer, uh, Sandy and, and Lindsay and I, and even some other people in Mississippi. Would a prayer coach be something similar to what you're talking about, that we, a group could have a coach when they go into an area? It would help them to, like, sort of, pun intended, map out what they need to do, you know, as far as prayer strategy? Absolutely. In fact, there's um, on the, the page which we sent you the link for that lists the various what we call prayer strategies. Um, and of them, prayer research or spiritual mapping is one of the prayer strategies. We have coaches that have been trained and experienced. And uh, we have some that specialize, like Brandon, you and Sandy, definitely with uh, we call it um, prayer and healing or. or um, um, when you think about um, all the aspects of health and uh, welfare and well-being of a team or an individual, that's one of the prayer strategies is prayer as, as member health. Yeah. Um, that's one of the prayer strategies. Prayer research or spiritual mapping is another. But there are coaches that are trained and prepared that then can set up appointments. And whether it's an individual or a team, they're ready to help kind of guide you toward resources that can help you, that can pray with you and pray through strategy together, make suggestions. And so it's a new uh, opportunity that we're offering this year. And there is a coaching um, link that you can go to there. And uh, there's an application that you fill out just to screen and then uh, figure out who would be the best coach to point you to. And then we connect you with them. We have a tool called Calendly that a lot are using to let you set up your own appointment yeah. Um, yeah. 
with the coach and then uh, it just becomes a relationship and if, however they can help. We call on each other. If, if uh, I hear, Oh, you want to know more about uh, uh, crisis response and prayer? I've got another friend that I can link you to. And so it's just by way of a relational network to help one another um, grow and learn from each other uh, in this journey. Yeah. I mean, you're right because I was sitting here thinking about how many missionaries we've prayed for and so many even that you sent to us. And it's like when you go out there on the mission field, I mean, we've encountered this, Sandy and I, and, and even and, and Lindsay as well, in our own lives. When you go out there on the mission field, you're on the front lines. If if, if you're not healed up enough, Satan will eat your lunch and pop your bag, you know? And yeah. He'll do it through family. He'll do it through finances. He'll do it through any possible way he can to discourage you and to, you know, make you quit. And uh, I've been through it, you know, with, with a, a depression that I, I struggled with. And if it wasn't for people out there to be able to help me get healed in my soul, it, it, I wouldn't been able to pull through it. So, yeah, I see exactly what you're in. And I've needed at times, I think, Lindsay and I both now need to check into this. We we need a, a prayer. We're trying to really push into the extraordinary prayer in the DMM cycle. And we think that that's what's been missing, going back to being God's dog and learning to heal and, and all that. And And honestly, a lot of it comes from my wife, Sandy, just saying, we need to listen first. We need, we need a good, we don't need a good idea. We need a God idea. And when you're a church mm-hmm. planner like me, you know, it leans more apostolically driven and all that kind of stuff. I just want to try a billion ideas and hopefully one of them will work. And she's like, no, we need to wait and we need to see what he wants us to do, you know. And uh, mm-hmm. a coach would very would be very advantageous for any anybody out there that, that uh, is trying to plan to go in and wants to in- engage in extraordinary prayer, which to me is the battle of the area is the the prayer. I feel like that it's like Gehazi's eyes being opened by Elisha. I think it was Elisha uh, of, of mm-hmm. seeing the battle that's out there. It's a spiritual battle and it's, it's, it's fault with prayer and everything else. Mm-hmm. I can't remember the famous theologian or missionary that said it, but everything else is just cleaning up, you know, it's just clean up. Mm-hmm. You know, the, you were talking about, um, the coaching, you know, if you think about the Apostle Paul, I think a lot of what he was doing, honestly, was traveling around coaching. They didn't have the telephone or internet like we do now, but I think he was revisiting them. Okay, how's it going? You know, checking in, you know, how can I help? Let's pray together. Let's listen together, encouraging them. And, you know, that's coaching. So yeah. I think it was part of the early church life. Uh, that was just a face to face. And that's why he made all those journeys was to go around and carry the gospel and then check up on them. How are you doing? How can I help? What's needed? Yeah. 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 You know, Ephesus seems to be, if you really look at that in Acts, that that seems to be more of a coaching thing because the whole region yeah. heard the gospel, but he didn't seem to be going anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. He said he, he would he'd want to labor where anyone else has, has labored I, I suspect that means do new works, but he definitely coached where an apostled, if that's even a word, apostled in different areas where he had been before. Yeah, like Ephesus and Rome and different areas like that. And then another, you know, we think about the letters he wrote, you know, which now, of course, are part of our New Testament, which were basically coaching letters, sure. right? Just giving guidance on how do you deal with particular situations. Uh, you know, and dealt with very specific situations that the churches were struggling with. Uh, so we need each other. We need the strengths that we carry and the anointings we carry. And I think it's part of what God's doing to knit his body together. The Bible talks about that Jesus is, that the body of Christ is being built up so that every joint supplies until we attain the full measure of the stature of Jesus. I think he's just bringing us together closer and closer helping us realize how much we really do need each other and showing us how to work alongside and encourage and lift up each other's arms. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Absolutely. Well, there's one other thing that I want to kind of, I guess, wrap this up with. You are involved in what 
what you have told me about are there. They're called Cities of Refuge, Goshen, and Collaborative Kingdom Communities. Can you tell us what those are and unpack what that is and where you see that going for the future of, I guess, probably the church? Yeah, I, I, uh, I'll say that I heard somebody talk about that the church is the means to the end of the kingdom. And um, I think that's really true that we're, we're seeing and we're working on seeing his kingdom come and his will being done on earth more and more as in heaven. And um, he's building us together as a bride um, and working on that, preparing us, you know, for his return. And he's coming back for a bride that's equally yoked with his son. And so I think there's a lot of, it seems like to me, a lot of work to be done there. But uh, in the idea of cities of refuge, or if you think about, uh, well, I'll start one by one. Cities of refuge in Leviticus, it, they were to mark out cities of refuge where someone could flee if they had uh, accidentally murdered someone and they they would be safe there until the death of the high priest, I believe it was, but it was a, a place of refuge. And then if you think about Goshen in uh, Egypt, when uh, the famine was there and uh, Jacob's family ended up being given refuge in the area of Goshen in Egypt, uh, part of the time they experienced the plagues along with the Egyptians, but uh, part of the plagues, they were sheltered from the plague and certainly the last one where the Passover, the blood of the lamb was put on the doorpost and lentils and they were in the house. And when that blood was seen, the death angel passed over. So that whole idea of a place of refuge during a time of judgment. Um, and I'll mention another way of saying it might be collaborative kingdom communities. I think God is drawing us together in his body closer and closer and um, just feeling that we are being called to really um, uh, come out of Babylon, come out of the world systems, mm. and come into the God's kingdom ways uh, in all areas, and to um, be able to lift up each other's arms, encourage each other. Uh, somebody else has described it like uh, locking shields. Uh, locking arms together like a shield wall standing side by like side like a sh yeah, shield yeah, wall like yeah. the old yeah the old turtle I what was it a turtle formation or something in the Roman legion yeah. days but uh mm -hmm. for what's coming you know I think he's creating places and spaces with communities that uh will be a shelter in the coming storm and that seems to be a word that's being spoken in many parts of the body I work globally and we're hearing that for a voice coming from the Holy Spirit in a lot of different places. Yeah, if if, if over the past two or three years, if if people haven't woke up, uh, they're mm -hmm. going to. And if they don't, then I feel I feel yeah. I mean, it's it's quite obvious that the world is different. The world has changed. I think about there's this line in Lord of the Rings at the beginning, and I, I don't ever get it right, but basically, it's one of the elves women is translating and saying the world is i can feel it in my bones i can feel that the world is different i can smell it i can taste it you know and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the world is it's different you know i know every generation seems to say that i think though that this time it's it's exponentially different i mean that's just my opinion yeah. so but i, I do yeah. know that on the elitist and this is going a little conspiracy a little bit, but on the elitist or newer world order timeline, 2030 is a big deal. So we got seven years of what they have planned or what they're, they're trying to do to transform and change the world. That, that kind of makes it seem even more possible that, that we're living in the exponential last of the last days, in my opinion. Yeah, there's a... Uh, we were just on a call earlier this morning. Um, they were talking about, you know, the situation that happened with Damar Hamlin. Yes. Um, and um, saying that they believe this year is going to be a year of sudden divine intervention, interruptions, sudden divine interruptions, like what happened there where it, 
propels everyone to their knees and to see God. And then they said the same, the FAA situation, when the uh, air traffic control systems were knocked out, it wasn't only their main system, it was their backup system and the system in Canada as well, all simultaneously Mm -hmm. uh, shut down for some reason. So it stopped air traffic. So they felt like God was emphasizing often when you see, you know, a double a double image of the same thing, you know, something similar, you know, really emphasizing. So just feeling like God's really saying this is going to be a year that they're going to be sudden divine interruptions. And there was a, a, a meme that uh, we rent to Amanda Shiflet, who's one of the, she's a prophetic voice. Uh, it says, there's no time left to wake the sheep. It's time to wake other lions. Mm-hmm. I think that may be the case. Um, but you were talking about how um, sensing this is something different. Uh, if you indulge me here, I'll read the, her prophetic word. It's called something is different today. Is that okay? Sure, absolutely. I often can feel when something is coming, a major event or happening. And today I feel that all of my nerves are on edge, not nervous or anxious, but just on edge. And I feel it in my physical body. This happens sometimes when big things are coming. Perhaps what I'm sensing might even be the, quote, perfect storm that many of us have sensed was coming for some time. I've asked several other prophetic friends, and many are sensing it also. I feel the warfare around whatever is happening and what is coming. There's much warfare between the holy and evil spirits in the spirit realm right now. I'm praying in the spirit a lot today, but having some difficulty breaking through. Interestingly enough, yesterday and the day before, I had several times of wonderful feelings of glory and in rapture, like the Lord was Lord was so near. I even had an experience in a dream of pure glory during worship, and it felt like my body was lifting up and I could almost not contain it. It was amazing. I sense that we are on the precipice of the glory of God being poured out in ways we have never experienced. Yet today, I feel the complete opposite of what I felt yesterday, but I still feel Him close by. If I press past the difficulty that I'm feeling, I can sense his spirit so close. It's a strange dichotomy. Darren and I are in a time like many of you of fasting and prayer and pressing in for what the Lord is wanting to do and what he has for us. And although I have done many fasts, this one feels different. This time it feels like he's just right there waiting for us to press in. He's always right there, don't get me wrong, but this time it's easier to access his presence and power. There are Kairos moments in history where the Lord draws us even closer in, and the veil between the spirit world is even thinner. I believe we've entered into that moment as we step through this Bethabara passageway. I also believe that is why there has been so much more warfare at this particular gate. I believe today, on January 11th, we're headed into another level of best times and the worst of times, both at the same time. I don't know when this will fully manifest, but I feel it strongly. Hashtag pray and prepare. And that was from Amanda Shiflett mm-hmm. from her Facebook um, post. So it sounds like what you were saying, uh, Brandon. Well, what's interesting is uh, I know Sandy's bells are going off in the background. Ding, ding, ding. Uh, we just did two days ago our, our podcast, our episode that we did was on spiritual prepping. And we went through, Lindsay and oh, I yeah. did a, uh, took the passage in Matthew, was it uh, 25, Lindsay? Yeah, I believe so, yeah. Yeah, about the, 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 the uh, wise and the, and the foolish virgins and, and their oil and intimacy and, you know, connection with the Father. We're going to have to, in these end times, be a part of communities that are all, we're all together listening and healing H E L L I N G to the the spirits moving, or we can miss. You know that the, the the scriptures say that even it's going to be so deceptive that even the elect get get you know confused or or befuddled from it. And yeah. I, yeah. I I believe personally that that we're sealed and with the Holy Spirit and saved and and all that kind of stuff. But I, I don't want to get off track. And he came the first time in a way that that you know, mystified everyone. I think this end time situation is probably going to be entirely unexpected. I think a lot of people have theorized different things, but it's going to be something totally out of our wheelhouse, I think, in a lot of ways. Yeah, that's been 
definitely one of the words we've been sensing was uh, the verse about suddenly I do a new thing. It suddenly springs forth. Do you not perceive it? That that the things we've done in the past will not work now. That it's a new thing and we have to be tuned in and ready. And the Isaiah 61 through 3, Arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth. Thick darkness is over the peoples, but the Lord rises upon you and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. So it's that both and. It's not light or darkness. It's light and darkness, both at the same yes. time. Well, uh, let me ask you this. I, I want you to kind of go into to, to more detail, if you would, about the, I mean, it's going to take the collaborative kingdom communities to, to, to be able to do this uh, in the end. Can you kind of unpack what does that look like practically? Or what have you been involved in that has shown you what a collaborative kingdom community is? Well, um, my history in this is fairly short. But um, I would say that as I'm having the Lord unpack it, I'm realizing, okay, a lot of it God already had us doing to some measure as we've done, uh, as we've been missionaries and done church planning movements, um, you tend to automatically work in community and you, you're, you're put in a place where you don't know what to do. So you have, you're in desperate dependence upon the Lord. So you're put into a posture of listening. And if God, if you don't show up, we're sunk because nothing's going to happen, you know? So yeah having to seek the Lord. But we went to a, Tom and I went to a training in South Dakota led by a fellow named uh, Craig Cook. He's got a book, which unfortunately is out of print, but it's excellent. It's called Places of Refuge, Mercy in the Coming Storm by Craig Cook. If you can get a hold of a copy, I highly recommend it. There's um, another one that's um, talking about um uh, Places of refuge, building building cities of refuge. Um, but this other one by Craig Cook, I would say, is probably my top top favorite. Unfortunately, like I say, it's out of print. There are some copies floating around, but they're ridiculously priced. Um, but my understanding is that I'll give you some examples from history. The Moravians, for example, mm -hmm. would be an example of a community of refuge or a, a, a a kind of a Goshen, they were actually fleeing from persecution in one place and Count Zinzendorf often offered them shelter on his estate. And then that became a collaborative kingdom community. And they, um, prayer was at the center of it, extraordinary prayer. They, from that place of prayer, God brought reconciliation among them. Um, they were experiencing God, um, showing them how to live together as community. They educated their children. They raised up, trained, and sent out missionaries. Incredible model, 100 years of unceasing prayer. Yeah. Another example would be things like the Underground Railroad during the Civil War days that hid and sheltered um, and helped uh, slaves you know, escaping. Another example would be um, like the Cory Ten Booms, the Ten Boom family during Nazi Germany. Uh, that was same, the hiding and fleeing of Jews out of. Uh, Germany. Um, there was a group called the Bielski Brothers. There's a movie made about it called, um, okay, now Defiance. I'm going to lose it. Daniel Defiance. Craig. Defiance, thank you. Uh, that talked about the Bielski Brothers that uh, helped shield several thousand Jews in the forests, and they never were able to be found. And they had a whole community, a mobile community with blacksmiths and schools and shops. And I don't know how they did it. It was incredible. Um, but those are just some of the examples. But like you say, Brandon, I think it was look different for each person and their situation. And I think there are groups that are being called Curtis. You mentioned Curtis Sargent and their family has been working on a, a, a combination kind of retreat center and kind of self-sustaining community um, where he is. Um, and there are others, Neil and Dana, I think are another and there are others. Um, our community here. There's a group of us that feel God's had his hand on this metropolitan area and that we're to be 
preparing ourselves as a Goshen or city of refuge. So we're together trying to explore, okay, Lord, what do you want us to do? What does that mean? So we're in that journey right now ourselves. You know, Lindsay, this this reminds me of when we interviewed Frank Viola, and he was talking yeah. about one of the missing ingredients in in rapid multiplication, that rapid multiplication is, is we, we've got it wrong. We're trying to go too fast instead of develop and mature a community before we reproduce, before we plant other communities. And that's more Acts, more Old Testament, I mean, more New Testament oriented. And I see that, Lindsay, in what she's talking about with through these uh, yeah. collaborative kingdom communities. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. Um, it's you got to have. I mean, you got to <laughs> to be a, a a refuge. You you need a pretty solid community that's been together and, and matured together, and you know had time to build up the proper resources. So. Yeah, that Liz, that was uh, Frank Bell was uh, critique of the modern like BMM CPM type stuff. Uh, he, I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's got a, a guy that's been in the house church movement back with Gene Edwards. Mm-hmm. And also with Neil Cole and a lot of those guys. But one of his critiques, and, and it really hit home when we interviewed him, to me, is that this rapidness of multiplication leads to immaturity, which leads to, you know, unsustainability, which I have seen. I mean, Sandy, Lindsay, and I have seen it even in what we've done with many groups and all that kind of stuff. And what he's he's advocating is, is not that we don't do the steps in the DMM process, the extraordinary prayer, the people piece, but that it has kind of been like, uh, I guess, uh, uh, kidnapped, so to speak, subjugated by this need that we have to win so many souls, so many souls, and it's missing out on the kingdom instead of, you know, it's focusing more on conversion instead of placing people in the kingdom, which is, a maturity thing. Am I making sense? Yeah. I think the, you know, for me, Tom and I also, uh, 2014 met this young man, Jonathan Frizz, that was carrying a vision for 10 days, which was, uh, from the feast of trumpets to the day of atonement, 10 days. That's called the days of awe in the Hebrew calendar. Uh, but as a time of prayer and fasting and repentance, and mourning, mourning over our sin, mourning for the lost and unreached, mourning for the reconnection of the Jews back into the body of Messiah, and yearning for the return of the Lord and the the preparation of the bride, you know, for the fulfillment of God's promises. And in experiencing that, coming aside for 10 days together with the community uh, and being in God's presence in an intense way like that, posturing yourself to ask him, Take inventory, Lord. What do you see and what what do I need to turn from to turn more toward you is transformative. And I think it becomes a boiler room for building a community, a kingdom community, uh, potentially. And I think that may be what God's doing is, is using things like that to draw together a core group of people that become that functioning ecclesia that... Yeah come together and begin to live out the kingdom. And it be, then it begins to grow organically. Uh, simple things grow, simple things multiply. Right, right. right. Yeah. And, and I, I think that, you know, there's whole branches of uh, DMM, CPM type stuff. I, I just don't think if the end times happen tomorrow, that a bunch of discovery Bible studies would survive. I mean, I'm just, I'm just going to throw it out there and, I'm not against discovery Bible studies. I think they're awesome. I think they're tools that we we do, but it's got we've got to have, like you said, a a functioning ecclesia uh, of believers, and 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 that takes time. I think part of this this critique that Frank had, 
he was thinking more about the old school of how groups would split instead of mul- multiply. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that was kind of where he was mm-hmm. coming from. So I get yeah. that. So the DMM stuff doesn't have that. We're always a part of two different groups, but, but there needs to be, to me, that's where uh, a guy, our, our listeners won't know who he is, but we all know who he is. And, and Lee Wood, I really appreciate the fact that he pushes the organicness that it starts with your family, goes out from your family, and it's, it's, it's organic before it's organizational, you know? Yeah. And yeah. that's what's going to survive. And that's what I think God is doing for the end times because I see him doing it all over the place. I'll send Lindsay a text. I'm like, look at this. This is a guy, a random guy that wouldn't, this would not be on his radar. And he's saying, I think the church needs to get back smaller, more intimate communions. Mm -hmm. And, and house church is another one of those loaded terms that I just don't use. You know, know, it's, it's got so many, Mm -hmm. Uh, so much baggage. Well, and it can be, honey, I shrunk the church. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, re- yeah, reactionary, reactionary against problems, you know, in the legacy or traditional church. Right. But that's not it either. Nope. You know, we're not a, we're not. That's not the point. Nope. Um, I think, I think that it may be. My daughter Honor and I were talking about. It's funny when we start realizing, okay, God's sort of forcing us to do things outside our comfort zone, yes. but that are moving us more and more in that direction of needing local believers that we're in relationship with, that we're walking together with, we're finding our way, we're figuring out what does it mean to live and walk with each other and with the Lord together in real life, you know, yeah. with all the warts and wrinkles, you know, that that involves, you know, struggling with trying to figure out how to homeschool and keep up with, you know, things of life and challenges and ministry opportunities and all of that. Uh, and I think, you know, maybe that's where God's at is in all the middle of the messiness of it. Yeah, I think another example you were talking earlier about the Moravians, I, I thought about Dietrich Bonhoeffer and his little quote group that he had in Germany, his little seminary, yeah. but it was uh, mostly, you know, where they learned to live together as and, and they learn to live together during governmental oppression, which I think that's what's coming in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, that's a really significant uh, story or narrative to, to kind of weigh out how they navigated the relationships there. Yeah. I, you may, you're probably familiar with Dr. Francis Schaefer and Edith mm-hmm. Schaefer. Yeah. And Labrie. Labrie. Yeah. You know, that community, yeah. I think, was a real. Um, impactful in that generation you know it was definitely for tom and i very impactful to to think about what does it mean to live life under the lordship of jesus and really was a powerful part of the start of our journey well that's interesting you say labrie because that was what i had in mind when sandy and i purchased this this center here it was to have a labrie type retreat center problem was we weren't close enough to any sort of college university any 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 kind of an area to really be able to have people in and influence them like he did but you know hindsight's mm-hmm. 2020 so we we look back and we made a lot of mistakes that we could have done but but it, that was kind of and i'm still not sure that that the ministry that is here with us is not sort of some sort of a city of refuge that we're still here to be a participant in in what's coming in the, in the end times. Mm-hmm. So uh, mm-hmm. let me, let me ask yeah. you, uh, Lizzie, do you have anything? I don't want to, do you have anything you want to ask her? Oh, uh, no, I, I can't, I can't think of anything else. I'm just enjoying soaking a lot of this in. Well, uh, Liz, if, is there any question that we haven't asked you that you would like, that you would have liked for us to ask you? I know it's kind of putting you on the spot a little bit, if there's not, that's fine. But is there anything that you would like to tell us that you would have wished we would have asked you about all this? Well, I mean, maybe going back to the idea, because I know you're thinking in terms of, you know, the supernatural and uh, and the, the dynamics, you know, that we often forget about. I think especially coming from the evangelical part of the church, we can uh, neglect thinking about the spiritual dynamics. 
But we've been talking about uh, spiritual mapping or prayer research, and we've been talking about, okay, what do we sense uh, that God seems to be speaking, you know, for where are we moving into? I think so many people have a sense that we've been in a liminal space, you know, a space between times, and that something else is coming. You know, the prophetic word I read from Amanda Shiflett mm -hmm. talking about, you know, something's coming, we can feel it. Yeah. Um, but I think the, as we are, plowing ground as the Lord's directing us, one of the keys that was a real breakthrough thing for me, I think, when Tom and I were living in the Himalayan area, and we had another fellow that was a movement catalyst come and co-teach with us, and he was talking about a couple of verses that I had not really stopped to think about, where he talked about um, where uh, the story Jesus tells about the man that was delivered of a demon, the demon goes and wanders in waterless places, comes back and find his, founds his place clean and empty. And he goes and takes seven others. And the state, last state of the man is worse than the first. Mm -hmm. And thinking about that when we are prayer walking, when we're using these tools, you know, to see areas opened for the gospel, we need to be occupying, mm -hmm. uh, you know, God. Uh, told Moses, I'm not going to drive out the peoples ahead of you or the wild animals ahead of you all at once, but little by little as you're able to occupy. I think that's an important thing that we forget about or don't, or we ignore um, as we're working that um, mm. God's, give, God's building our capacity to occupy as we're taking territory, taking ground. And as our capacity is increasing, then he's giving us more ground. So again, going back to us getting ahead of him, you know, we need to be moving with him as he's opening up territory, opening up the hearts of people, that we're filling it with the word, filling it with the spirit of God, that the kingdom is coming and occupying, that we're not leaving it empty. Um, and there are just some stories, you know, about practical examples of areas. Uh, for instance, a young fellow was working in India had prayer walked through some areas and was seeing the numbers of temples diminishing, the numbers of idols diminishing. But then he realized by the time he got back around to some of the ones he had done quite a large area, that the people were more resistant to the gospel rather than less. And he, he felt that that was some of the principle is he had opened it, but he hadn't occupied. And so that had become even more entrenched. Mm. Um, wow. Another part is, um, he who does not gather with me is like one who scatters, is another verse. And thinking about um, that we need to have the intentional plan to gather the harvest in. You know, if you plant, uh, so I can tell a personal story on myself. Uh, we had lived and we were living in Costa Rica, and I had gotten this book about square foot gardening. And so I had the fellow that was helping us there set up all these square foot gardens with all these vegetables and stuff I had planted. And we ended up uh, needing to come back to the United States. And uh, as we were leaving, I got this feeling from the Lord that this trip is not going to be what you think, that you won't be coming back. And it was just an odd, you know, just a sense that kind of dropped in my spirit. Sure enough, we had things happen and we weren't able to return. Uh, and so that we had worked, worked and worked and planted all that stuff and it just went to waste. Um, you know, we weren't able to gather it in. And, uh, in that case, you know, it was a lot of work planting and sowing, but then not being able to gather in that harvest. So I think that that whole idea of walking in step with God and occupying the area he's giving us and, and letting him grow our capacity as we're moving and also having that intentional plan together at the same time. Two really important pieces that I don't hear spoken about very much, but I think they're really keys to seeing his kingdom coming and being established more and more, um, you know, as we're looking to share the gospel, share the good news, share the life of the Lord with others. Those are, I think, two keys to keep in mind. Yeah. Um, Interesting. Well, let's, uh, we're getting into a, 
I think we need to land this plane, get into the time of landing this plane. <laughs> and uh, Liz, uh, we appreciate it so much. We appreciate yeah. everything that um, you've given us all this knowledge. You know, you just given us a knowledge download and just want to thank you for coming on our show. There is one thing we usually do at the beginning, but uh, I'll let you do it at the end and, and then we can wrap it up. If you can do it briefly, that's the key. We usually ask people, you know, what is the most supernatural or miraculous thing that you've ever seen? Can you do that like in five minutes? Yeah, I can. Um, supernatural or miraculous. So, I mean, I could probably tell you several stories. One of the things that was astounding to me, we were visiting in uh, India near Delhi and we're just walking through. Our family was being led uh, around an area that had um, old ancient buildings uh, and there were stairs that where you could go up kind of on the upper level and it overlooked uh, the, the kind of the grounds below. And I had walked up and I was just kind of wandering around and I looked over the edge of the wall and down below, it was quite a ways down. So it must have been probably maybe the equivalent of three or four stories up. So I was looking and it looked like a fellow was laying down, but he was high in the air. And another fellow, he was about the height of uh, the other fellow's head. So maybe five, six feet off the ground. But I was trying to figure out, I didn't see any platform or anything. And um, I was kind of staring, just trying to comprehend what am I seeing? And all of a sudden he falls to the ground. There wasn't anything under him. He was levitating mm. and it, Took me by surprise, but they looked up at me. I was a good distance from them up and over. I hadn't made any sound. And they both looked up at me like angry, like I had done something. And I pulled back, pulled back over the wall. But I realized it was an example of just the power of God in us disrupts the darkness. And it was a shock to me to see that. And it was a shock to realize, oh my gosh. This guy's just floating in the mm. air. Was this a Tibetan Buddhist yeah, again? It was in it was in India, so probably could have been Hindu okay. in that area. It was a lot of Hinduism, but there's a lot of in the Himalayan area. There's a lot of overt manifestation of demonic power that was very disconcerting for me as a Westerner. That's been brought up on the secular humanist theory about no, there's no such thing as the supernatural. Mm. So. Um, that's kind of the negative side, but also the positive, I guess, in that apparently the power of God. I hadn't prayed. I hadn't spoken. I was just trying to figure out what was happening. But the presence of God in me apparently disrupted that whatever was happening there. So Yes, yes yeah. see, that's awesome. That, that, that's a good way to end the podcast, just to show that the, just, just us being carriers of his presence, the light inside of us pushes away the darkness. And, and, and even if we have to know what is true which could be the darkness out there we still the light will prevail and that's what we want to leave with everybody out there the light will prevail and i want to thank liz again and thank my co-host Lindsay. yeah thanks liz good to be with you Thanks for listening and supporting us. And remember, stay naturally supernatural.